Welcome to the podcast, I'm your host Remy, and this is Simple Reflections of Christianity, where we look at issues of Christianity and seek the wisdom of antiquity. Once again welcome to Season 2 of Simple Reflections of Christianity with me Remy. A brief compend of Bible truth by Archibald Alexander, 1772-1851 professor in the Theological Seminary at Princeton, New Jersey. Archibald Alexander, April 17, 1772, October 22, 1851, was an American Presbyterian theologian and professor at the Princeton Theological Seminary. He served for nine years as the president of Hampton Sydney College in Virginia and for 39 years as Princeton Theological Seminary's first professor from 1812 to 1851. Chapter 1 Being of God Of all conceptions of the human mind, the idea of God is the most sublime. It is not only sublime, but awful. Everything else appears diminutive while the mind is occupied with this thought. Though the idea of an eternal and infinite being is too great for the grasp of the human intellect, yet it is suited to the human mind. It fills it, and produces a feeling of reverence, which is felt to be a right emotion. If there is no such being, this is the grandest illusion which ever possessed the imagination of man. If it be an error, then error is preferable to truth, for on this supposition, truth in its whole compass has nothing in grandeur to compare with illusion. Remove this idea, and the mind is confounded with an infinite blank. Deprived of this, the intellect has no object to fill it, it is confounded and distressed with the retrospect of the past, and prospect of the future. But it cannot be, that this noblest of all conceptions of the human mind should be false, the capacity of the soul of man to form such a conception is a proof of the existence of a great and good and intelligent first cause. God has not left himself without a witness of his being and his perfections. It may well be doubted whether the evidence of a divine existence, the author of all things, could be clearer and stronger than it is. A display of exquisite skill in every organized body around us is far better evidence than any extraordinary appearance, however glorious, or the uttering of any voice, however tremendous. Such miraculous phenomena would indeed powerfully excite and astonish the mind, and would be a certain proof of the existence of a superior being, but would, in reality, add nothing to the force of the evidence which we already possess, in the innumerable curiously and wisely organized animal bodies by which we are surrounded. And if we were confined to the examination of our own constitution of mind and body, the innumerable instances of manifest wisdom in the contrivance of the several parts, their exact adaptation to one another, and their wonderful correspondence with the elements of the external world without us, the evidence of an intelligent cause is irresistible. If any man surveys the structure of the human body, its bones and joints, its blood vessels and muscles, its heart and stomach, its nerves and glands, and all these parts put into harmonious action by a vital power, the source of which is not understood, if he surveys the adaptation of light to the eye, or into the ear and to the lungs, and of food to the stomachs of different animals, and notices the exact correspondence between the appetites of animals, and the power of their stomachs to digest that food and that only which is craved by their appetites respectively, and considers what wonderful provision has been made for the preservation and and defense of every species, how much wisdom in their covering, instruments of motion and defense, in the propagation of their respective species, and the nourishment of their young, I say, if any man's mind is so constructed as to see all these things, and yet remain skeptical respecting the existence of an intelligent cause the conclusion must be that such a mind is destitute of reason, or has not the capacity of discerning evidence and feeling its force. In prosecuting the argument from the evident appearance of wisdom in the structure of animal and vegetable bodies, is not necessary to multiply these cumulative proofs, for as one watch or one telescope would prove the existence of a skillful artist, so the careful examination of a few specimens of animal or vegetable organization will satisfy the mind, as well as the minute survey of thousands of similar organizations. The attempts of ingenious and scientific men to account for these appearances, so evidently indicative of design, without the supposition of an intelligent creator, are so replete with folly, that we cannot but think such men abandoned of God to believe a lie, because they like not to retain the knowledge of God in their thoughts, so that it is still true, that it is the fool who hath said in heart, there is no God. If all other arguments for the being of God were wanting, the truth might be inferred with strong probability from our moral feelings. Every man feels himself bound by a moral law, he cannot but see the difference between right and wrong in many actions. The former he feels to be obligatory the latter not. 
Whence this binding internal law, so deeply engrave on the heart of every man, that he cannot escape from the feeling of its obligation? Does it not clearly intimate that there is a lawgiver, who has provided a witness of his right in every bosom? Where there is a moral law there must be a moral governor. As long as conscience exists in the breasts of men, atheism cannot prevail long. In the tumult of the passions, in the glare of false reasonings, God may for a while be forgotten and his very being denied, but, ere long, these moral feelings will bring men back to the acknowledgement of their Creator. There is good reason to think that the preservation of some religion among all nations is more owing to their moral constitution than to any reasoning on the subject. We need not fear, therefore, that atheism will ever prevail very generally, or continue long. Chapter 2 Personality and Perfection of God It is admitted by all who believe that God exists, that He possesses all conceivable perfection, and right reason would lead us to the opinion, that as He is infinite He must possess attributes of which, at present, we can form no conception. Our ideas of excellence cannot exceed the manifestations of perfection in the creation, but it would be absurd to suppose that any excellence could be in the creatures, which did not exist in a higher degree in the Creator. As all men who acknowledge a God agree, that all possible perfection belongs to His character, it is unnecessary to adduce any arguments for its proof. Indeed, it seems to be an intuitive truth, that all perfection must reside in the first cause. The very idea of God is that of a being infinitely perfect. Whatever doctrine, therefore, derogates from the perfection of the Supreme Being must be false. It is, therefore, the dictate of reason, that we should remove from our idea of God, everything which argues any weakness or imperfection. And as our ideas of natural and moral excellence are derived from contemplating the creatures, we must rise to just conceptions of the Deity by ascribing these excellencies to Him, in an infinite degree. Upon this principle, we ascribe to God unity, spirituality, power, knowledge, immensity, eternity, immutability, sovereignty, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Upon this principle, God must be independent, and perfectly free to act according to His own pleasure. God is a person, distinct from the universe. Every being who possesses intellect and will, is a person. The execution of any work of design, in which there is an adaptation of means to ends, and a harmonious operation of parts to produce a desirable effect, necessarily involves the exercise both of intellect and will. The idea that the universe is God, or that God is the soul of the world, but not a person distinct from it, is nothing more than a disguised system of atheism. God is distinct from, and independent of all creatures. Chapter 3 The Holy Scriptures The Bible is made up of many books written through a period of more than 1500 years, by men who profess to have received their doctrines from God, and to have committed them to writing by His direction. These scriptures, then, must contain a revelation from God, or be a vile imposture. On the latter supposition it is marvelous, that the same purpose of deception should be maintained for so long a period, by a succession of impostors, all agreeing in the same sentiments, and that the cheat should never have been discovered. Again, when we examine the moral character and tendency of these books, it is unaccountable that, throughout, they should inculcate a sublimer theology and purer morality than any other books in the world, that they should condemn every species of vice and especially, that they should severely reprobate all falsehood, deceit and fraud, thus, in almost every page, pronouncing their own condemnation. As it cannot be explained what could have made wicked impostors wish to inculcate such doctrines, so it is contrary to all experience, that men of habitually corrupt minds should be able to conceive or write discourses of so much moral purity and surpassing excellence. Read the Sermons of Christ. Peruse the Epistles of the Apostles, and try to believe that these discourses proceeded from men steeped in fraud and corrupt principles. We are ready at once to say, impossible. When we see light, we know that it must have proceeded from a luminous body. When we see wisdom in creation, we know that there exists a being of incomparable wisdom, and when we read a book of extraordinary power of argument, or replete with sublime imagery, we are sure that such works are the product of gifted minds. What shall we think then, when we behold in the scriptures moral excellence shining forth in the purest and most comprehensive precepts, and embodied in bright examples of consistent piety and virtue? The character of Jesus Christ, as portrayed by the evangelists, is itself a moral phenomenon, which cannot be accounted for on any other supposition than that the writers were inspired. It is easy in words to ascribe exalted virtues to a hero, 
and to exaggerate his excellences by heaping up pompous epithets, but to describe a character of perfect virtue by merely relating what he said and did, and to place him often in circumstances where it is not only difficult to do right, but where an extraordinary wisdom is requisite to determine what is right, is not easy. But in this way has the character of Jesus Christ been delineated by the evangelists, without one word of eulogy. And let it be remarked, that they were unlearned men, who had enjoyed none of the advantages of a liberal education. Let any number of common, uneducated men undertake to write a history of some eminent person, and what would be the result, even if their intentions were honest. No honest inquirer can read the Pentateuch, and fail to rise from the perusal, astonished at the wisdom, the majesty, the purity, and the simplicity of the composition. Is it possible then that the five books of Moses are a base forgery? Could an impostor have persuaded a whole nation to adopt a burdensome and expensive code of laws, if he had not been able to give undoubted evidence of his divine mission? And could he have so deluded a whole nation as to induce them to believe that they saw the miraculous judgments of God poured out on the Egyptians, that they saw the sea divided at the word of Moses, that they actually marched through an arm of the sea as on dry land, and that they had been fed with manna rained from the clouds for forty years, and had seen the water gushing from the dry rock upon the touch of the wonder-working rod, if no such events had ever occurred? The history of these miracles is so interwoven with the common events, and with the religious institutions of the Jews, that they cannot be separated. Let the skeptic tell us what motive could have induced any wicked impostor to write the book of Psalms. Here we have, not merely sublime poetic imagery, but a spirit of fervent elevated devotion, to which there is no parallel in all the heathen writings. He must have been a strange impostor, that could compose such songs, or could have felt any pleasure in such elevated, spiritual exercises. Can the deus now produce any compositions which will bear a comparison with these? Again, read the book of Proverbs. Do you see any marks of imposture here? Do we not find concentrated more useful maxims of prudence and political economy, and more excellent moral precepts than can be gathered from all the sages of the pagan world? But, it may be alleged, that men differ in their tastes respecting the internal excellence of literary compositions, and that in a matter of so great importance we ought to possess some more decisive evidence of divine inspiration. Well, what will be considered sufficient evidence that God has made to men a revelation of His will? Will it be satisfactory, if they who profess to be inspired are unable to do works which are far above the power of man, and which require the almighty power of God? No one will doubt that if God give His attestation to any declaration, it should be received as true, for he is not a man that he should lie. If then, the apostles actually wrought miracles in the name of Jesus, and in confirmation of their doctrine, it cannot be denied that they were inspired. That such miracles were actually wrought openly and in the presence of watchful and bitter enemies is a matter of record. The four evangelists have testified in the Gospels, that Christ gave sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, health to the sick, sound limbs to the cripple, and that in several instances, before a multitude of people, he raised the dead. They testify, that after his crucifixion he rose from the dead, and that forty days after his crucifixion he sent down, as he had promised, the Holy Spirit, on the apostles, bestowing upon them and others various miraculous gifts, which Paul publicly testifies were common in the churches. The truth of Christianity then, rests on this single point, is the testimony of these miracles true, or a mere fable? that the Gospels were written near the time when these things were done is capable of the fullest proof. Indeed, had not these facts been credited fully by the first disciples, they never would have submitted to such sacrifices, and exposed themselves to such dangers, as we know they did. All earthly considerations weighed heavily on the other side. Every convert to Christianity is, therefore, a witness of the truth of these miracles for they had every motive to examine into the truth and the facts were of such a nature that they could not have been deceived. It does, indeed require, strong evidence to satisfy the mind that there has been a departure from the common course of nature, but testimony may be so strong that it would be unreasonable to doubt of the miracles which it is brought to attest. It is admitted that there have often been false witnesses, and that we may be deceived by trusting to insufficient testimony, but, we know, also, that in many cases our faith in testimony is as strong as in those things which have passed before our eyes. The point of examination then is, whether it is more probable that the testimony is false, or that a miracle has been wrought. If many persons, without any motive to deceive, and without previous concert, agree and stand to it in the midst of threatenings and sufferings, that they have witnessed miracles, it would be folly to disbelieve. 
and, especially, if such events followed in such immediate and continued succession as can only be accounted for by supposing the miracles to have been performed, the evidence may arise to such a degree of certainty as to assure us that we are not deceived. Now, the conversion of the civilized world to Christianity can never be accounted for on any supposition but the truth of the miracles and supernatural influence accompanying the gospel. And the whole train of succeeding events goes to corroborate the truth of the evangelical history. Another incontrovertible evidence of the truth of Christianity is the salutary effects which it has produced in the world. The conversion and reformation of sinners has been a standing proof of the divine origin of the Bible, and this evidence is not confined to ancient days. Blessed be God, clear and striking instances of the reformation of wicked men have occurred under our own observation. And the gospel has produced in our own times such a remarkable change in the moral and civil condition of some of the most ignorant, degraded, and vicious tribes of heathen, that if there were no other evidence of its truth, this would go far to satisfy an honest mind. Can any reasonable man believe that preaching a cunningly devised fable would turn men from their sins, to which they had been long habituated? Hundreds and thousands, also, in Christian lands can testify, that the truth of God has produced a powerful and salutary effect on their own minds, convincing them of their sin and danger, and exciting in them trust in Christ, which has enkindled their love, and brought sweet peace into their troubled breasts. And we see, continually, the power of the gospel to afford consolation in affliction and to buoy up the soul with assured hope, even in the hour of death. But, if all the convincing proofs, above mentioned, were wanting, the undeniable prophecies which have been literally fulfilled, are a clear demonstration of a divine revelation, for who can predict distant future events but God alone? The prophecies relate to the fortunes of the Jewish people, to the destiny of many great and proud cities and nations, but the most important predictions of the Old Testament relate to the Messiah, which were literally fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. Yet no prophecy of Scripture is more striking and convincing than that of Christ respecting the destruction of Jerusalem, and the ruin and dispersion of the Jews, the fulfillment of which is recorded in the history of Josephus who was not a Christian, but an eyewitness of the facts. <laughs>